Well, Rick and Eileen, it's a pleasure to be with both of you once again. I always enjoy your company. And I know you're, uh, you're involved in some wonderful ministry, and I, I would like to capture a little bit of that to share with other church members around the world. So let me ask you, Rick, um, to speak to a couple of issues for us. Uh, some of our members uh, feel badly because of their small church size. Uh, there are a lot of churches that are 15 to 20 members in size. And sometimes they feel, uh, I'll just say a bit distressed that that's the size of their church. Uh, and I think everyone goes through a period of time where that might bother them, but then they eventually come through the other side. And in talking with you, you, you mentioned you're not bothered by that and that you've had a couple of moments of insight about it. And I'd like for you to share that, if you would, with us. Okay. In the beginning of our outreach time where we were serving the community, I looked at resources, money, bodies, and thought, how are we going to do this? And God led us to a situation where I discovered personally with my own experience that having too many people distracted us from the one-on-one -on -one relationships. And so being small allows for a lot more intimacy. It allows for a lot more direct, intentional relationship. And so the size is relative to how you interact. If I was in a larger congregation, I would not have the freedom to do what I do now because of the number of people I have to relate to. Yes, no, that's, that's well said. And maybe you can tell us a bit about the outreach ministry that you and Eileen and others are involved in in your church. We'd be happy to. Right now, we have a Tuesday with showers, laundry, and a meal provided. Recently, we started bringing in the King County medical van, dental van, and that connects with the community directly around our church. Uh, people are beginning to come and say, what is this for? And we're telling them uh, it's for the people living in our area to get medical and dental services. It also relates directly to the homeless. A lot of the folks are veterans. On Wednesdays, we serve a meal. We have computer time for looking at jobs, doing email phone time and on Wednesday there is local regional mental health counseling addiction counseling other things related to that that can be um, beneficial to someone getting off the street or getting back to work excellent so it almost seems like you're a, a unofficial caseworker bringing services to the people who need them yeah and for me personally looking at what my job is it's a lot like a traffic cop at an intersection, having people come and go here and go there at the right time just to help people meet and then get going. Uh, related to what we talked about earlier about the size of the church being small, I know your location of your church because I visited it, <laughs> and you're right across the street from, if I recall correctly, a Lutheran megachurch, which would be intimidating for most people, like how are we going to attract people when the megachurch is the big stadium show, but uh, I think your experience has shown that that's nothing to be intimidated about. Could you share why? Um, absolutely. That church, after witnessing what happens, meeting some of the people that have come and benefited uh, by the time in our church on an outreach day, the Lutheran Church people have discovered that there is a mission field in their backyard and they want to learn that DNA and learn how to do those jobs. Mm -hmm. And so with that being the first point of communication as we started discussing, they wanted to sponsor us and financially was the way they did it. But the beautiful part of this goes beyond that first thing that occurs. Now we have prayer partners, we have partners in certain activities and events, and a network is forming that is now growing out into more churches in the community. And it all started because we went and said, we have need, and we see that you have a couple of people who know how to do this. And that's how it started. So you've 
created a network of ministry mm -hmm. between these existing congregations. And it's kind of neat. Our little church is the point man for this whole thing. Uh, let's ask Eileen. I know um, jumping into uh, a ministry that uh, is somewhat uh, a frightening one, dealing with homeless people mm -hmm. and people with so many needs, uh, some of them uh, medical addictions, uh, medicine, you know, but those kinds of problems. What was it that uh, got you first involved in working with that kind of people? I didn't want to, to start with. Um, because of the old conversation that I was raised in, we were the one and only and those people were going to perish. Mm -hmm. And I had that attitude after everything was said and done and the new covenant was brought out that I wasn't sure I could trust. And Steve Shim asked me to um, make a pot of soup for 40 people because they were freezing because the lights were out and I really, really detested the thought of feeding homeless people because, hey, why don't you get a job? Why don't you get over who you think you are and why are you thinking, you know, your entitlement thing? And then after that, I did it and God softened my heart a little bit and about, I think it was two months later, we had a really, really bad cold snap. And now this was in 2008 and Rick and I were sitting in the living room with our daughter and her husband and I said, Rick, what are we going to do about those poor people in the woods? We got to feed them soup. We got to get them warm. And before Rick could get off the phone talking to one of our helpers, Roy Andreessen, my son in law and my daughter and I had two pots of soup ready to go. And we opened up the church. And, excuse me, the people have taught me how to show Christ's love. They know who Jesus is, they have stepped aside. But they know through Rick and I and the rest of the people that work with us that Christ has always been there with them through whatever. And they love us and I love them. And every time we open up the shelter, it's come on in, there's room in the inn and a nice hot cup of coffee and some soup. And I, I'm the one who is blessed by this mm. because Christ softened me. Mm. So a lot of these people come from a background of having attended church at some yes. time. And now they're in a situation of total need and want, and dare I say they feel unloved, unwanted, exactly. uncared for. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. your point of contact with them has been, you are loved, we do care for you. Yes. We don't get make them um, watch the Passion of the Christ. We don't preach to them prior to a meal. We show, they you know they know they're loved. It's just. You can ask them, hmm. and they love coming to see us on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. It's uh, it seems like you're saying it's been a surprise. You enjoy the fellowship with them. Oh, I do. In fact, I'll be honest. I sometimes enjoy it more than I would with the society, other part of society, because yeah. I get to learn more about them and why their addiction is drugs or alcohol or you know. And it it helps. It helps us to learn more of Jesus and give more of Jesus. Excellent. Another thought that I have that I'd like you to address, um, it, it, we were talking earlier about uh, a lot of these people um, don't mind being away from the society and the rest of the community. And in fact, it takes some kind of work and transition them back into uh, being a productive person of society and they wouldn't go to a mega church to find that many have gone to those churches and the people that are in that environment are process oriented they're system oriented and the people we deal with don't fit into average processes or systems that we think of in churches and a larger church doesn't relate to the one-on-one -on -one daily time spent together. Yeah. So the best place uh, that they can transition back into normal living is with a small church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the ministry you provide. It is. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the course of doing this for the last three to four years, have you experienced any growth? Members that stay on or 
absolutely. Uh, one gal who was able to quit alcohol, if she didn't, she would have died in the last year, and her husband was able to withdraw from drugs. They got off the street and got into housing. We wound up baptizing her a year ago, and she came and asked for that baptism because of the love that was shown her and the fact that she not only felt, but she knew she was equal mm -hmm. to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that comes from what's said from the pulpit and what's said in conversation. It's like the old saying, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Mm -hmm. We all mm -hmm. stand the same there. Uh, what, one more thing I'd like you to, uh, to mention or, or give us any insight uh, about. In the course of this ministry you've been doing for several years now, uh, share some success stories. You don't have to give names because we don't want to you know, highlight people's names in their dire circumstances, but without naming them, tell me what some of the things are they were, the destructive lifestyles that they're in and what they've escaped. Well, we have two young ladies that were prostitutes um, and drug users. One of them lost their children, three of them. She has now been clean and sober and off the street for two years. Mm. She has her children back and she is in a relationship with a clean and sober man mm. who loves her and the kids and she's doing well and she will not let anybody come to her house that smokes and drinks and does anything, take the shoes off at the door and I'm living inside now. So that's that's her idea and she's a wonderful person yeah. even when she was in her addictive state you know sure. time and her prostitution she was the lovely woman but it's it's wonderful to see the transition from having no barriers yeah <laughs> um, to barriers to protect mm -hmm. your family and mm -hmm. the children mm -hmm. yeah that's there's another gal that we met when we first started into the outreach in the community who came to us and we were told to beware and keep our distance from her emotionally and physically. And after two years, we found that she had these erratic emotional and character swings. She would go from gentle and kind to very violent and aggressive. And mm -hmm. as we continued to watch her and make her feel welcome by just simply opening the door, giving her food and not requiring anything of her. One day she came and asked when the medical and mental health people would be there. Over a period of 14 months, she felt comfortable enough to talk to a doctor to see uh, that her health care got taken care of and brought back to a good normal level. But in the process, she was able to find a medication and that medication corrected for a chemical imbalance in her brain that led to acute bipolarism. And after 23 years of living in the woods in Renton and Federal Way, for the first time since she was 17 years old, that 23 and a half years later, she went into permanent housing mm -hmm. because she was stable mm -hmm. mentally for the first time. Wow. That reminds me of a a story of Jesus. Uh, <laughs> that, that these are phenomenal stories to see this kind of change. Maybe, uh, it, in conclusion, is there any insight you can share uh, with any small church out there that uh, isn't doing any outreach ministry and is wondering what they ought to do? It's not about religion. Mm -hmm. It's about relationship, and the way we have it from the Master, from Jesus, is. It connects and it works best one to one, eye to eye, plate to plate, fork to fork, sitting with someone and sharing time. And sharing time is what builds trust. And when there's trust, that trust will purchase faith that you'll be what you said. And that door then opens. And so whether you're in a larger church or a smaller church, remember, the fewer people that you have to socially enact with, the easier it is to have a one-to-one -one relationship with someone. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's become our DNA and who we are. Excellent. It has become our identity. And Christ said, what you do for the least of these, you do unto me. And that's been Rick's and my motto for the last four or five years. So 
it's it's all about Jesus, and he'll show you how to get to where you're supposed to be. And that's a perfect conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I think you're going to like the interview that we forgot we did. Oh, yeah, we forgot If I can figure out how to get to you.